Oh. Hi, everyone. It's really nice being on stage instead of hooking up stuff in the back. So uh, I'm really happy you came. I'm really happy you're here. Um, today I get to share something really nice that I've been working on for a very long time. And I've been playing with this at work. It was an idea that we had. And at some point, someone said, well, that, that does sound like a good idea. How about you try doing it? And then it dawned on me that people were taking me way too seriously. So now I get to share this with you because it actually works and exists. So I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Sawyer, Sawyer X. I work at Booking.com. Of course, we're hiring. I don't know if anyone heard, if anyone's likely not sure, and maybe they're at their quota, but we really are hiring. And if you're interested, come see us. And this might be a project that you will be working on if you're interested. Most of the projects that people work on at the company are things that they find interest in. So I'm going to talk about Paquette. Paquette is an unopinionated meta, unopinionated meta packaging system. And it is hard to break down. It takes me a very long time to really explain what we're trying to solve with Paquette. And hopefully, with this talk, we'll be a primer on this. First, a partial warning for a partial vaporware. Basically, everything you will see works. But not everything we want in it is there. So I'm going to first talk about things that we do have, how it works, the ideas behind it. Everything you will see does work. But at the end, I'm going to cover things that we don't have working yet. So the unwarning to this is that it's definitely less vaporware than you think. It has changed in the last month, so I added this statement. OK. So what is packet, uh, the unopinionated meta packaging system? So to explain this, I think I should start with explaining packaging. Packaging is the goal of taking some library or some application you have and putting it somewhere else, OK? And packaging is a solved problem, but not completely. All of packaging had been solved, but not put together. So parts of it were solved, and then other parts of it were solved that don't work with the previous solution. And then a different part was solved that doesn't work with the other two. So all of it was solved, but it wasn't really solved. And we realized that we really need to solve it. So let me talk a bit about the users of the packaging systems. There are two main users. First of all, there are desktop users. And desktop users, you could call them end users or whatever. And this is basically all of us at some point. You have in your laptop modules. You have in your laptop libraries. You have in your laptop applications. My Firefox and my, uh, the, all the applications that I'm using in order to show you this, Vim that I use to edit everything, those are all applications. They all use libraries. So I am a user of this. But you also have companies that are main users of packaging which is some of us at some point, really. And there are this, I think this splits to two when it comes to companies. First, you have the system administrators. And sysadmins have a particular goal of creating packages. They usually don't use it. Some system administrators write their own stuff. Nowadays, it's called DevOps. It used to just be called sysadmins who also code. But you also have end users. And end users are those that install whatever the system administrator packaged and then use it to build things in the company, right? How many people have stuff installed on their computer? OK? <laughs> I'm going to implicitly assume you all raise your hand. Or just, we're just too tired. But how many people work at a company and you use a library at the company that you need the sysadmin to either install, package, approve, validate, right? This happens. You need this. And there are a lot of reasons for it. You want to make sure that you have the package that works for you, that it's been tested, that maybe you need to patch, that you want to make sure they have the right version, et cetera. So packaging have a lot of requirements. And I'm going to cover some of them. There are plenty more. But I'm covering the main ones that I think are relevant for this talk. First, speed. We want everything to be fast all the time, everywhere. When it comes to packaging, this is very, very valuable, especially if you are a company. But even if you're not, let's say you're just an end user, you have a desktop, and all you do is install, and you don't care about speed, or you don't care about speed. But now we have CPAN M, and CPAN M is, installs way faster than CPAN. And we also have CPM that installs faster than CPAN minus, CPAN M. And we also have static installs, and static installs don't even run like an entire build system, you just copy the files over because that's way faster. So we, we also want that speed. Has anyone here ever tried installing Catalyst? OK, okay. I, I have. Has anyone used Padre and tried to install it? I get some two people. 
they already look bitter. I feel you. Because they have a lot of dependencies. It can take a very long time. So, okay. Speed is important, obviously. Also, library dependencies. You want to depend on other stuff. And when you want to depend on other stuff, you want it to be when you install it to have it. You don't want to try and install something and it says, oh, I couldn't. Why? Because they didn't have that thing. Oh, well, let me get that thing. How many people have installed entire installations of modules of Perl or Python or whatever language and you downloaded every tarball and did it manually? I did it a few times. It was incredibly frustrating until the discovery worked in, in until I got CPEN and CPEN minus working. But that is different from dependency accuracy. Dependency accuracy means two things. First, that you can handle not just the dependencies, but also correctly the right versions, right? Sometimes it's not the right version. Sometimes in Perl we have modules, we also have distributions, and they're both under a release. So we have three definitions, and you can get them wrong. Now, it also might mean that you want dependencies across languages. So CPN will not install a C library for you. PyPy will not install a C++ library for you, etc. So all of those tools are very good at dependencies, but sort of, and their accuracy is also sort of. But I'm getting into the comparisons that we'll do in a bit. These are features that a lot of people don't think about, but we do. Atomicity, the idea that you could either install everything or nothing, is incredibly important. Imagine you're doing a rollout. How many people here have rolled out code in their life, current company, previous company, doesn't matter. Have you ever rolled out something? Yeah, you have, right? What if it fails halfway through? Not fun, right? Not a good time. Not a good time. So atomicity is really important. You basically want to say, hey, if it worked, it worked. If it didn't, everything should still work just the same. I just didn't get to roll out. How many people love Git that it will actually either push successfully or not? And that's it. There is no broken state, right? Isn't it great? Someone says, well, the push didn't work. How can I fix this? You don't. Just try to push again. So this is very important. Upgrade is not the same as install. Upgrade is moving forward. But revert is moving forward by taking something that happened. It's also different. It's not necessarily downgrade. Maybe your move forward was to downgrade. I'm sorry. Maybe your move forward was to upgrade, and then a revert would be to downgrade. You're moving forward by removing the upgrade that happened. So a lot of these systems don't do that. The revert is the equivalent of a rollback. You rolled out. It didn't work. You roll back, right? Or you do a hotfix. All of those are ideas that have similar, uh, share similarities with this. We also want multiple instances. This is something that we didn't think about for a very long time, but now it is crucial, right? So we have virtualization, we have containers, and all of that stuff. But still, on the same machine, we still want to have multiple instances of the same thing. And it's very, very, very important. At work, we have a system that is in charge of installing various things that the system needs. It's written in Perl, just like almost every single thing we write. We really like Perl. We know a heck of a lot of Perl, and we use it for almost everything. And we do it well. So that system is written in Perl, and it upgrades Perl. Can anyone find a flaw? What if it failed to install things that it itself uses? Whoops, you now can't do anything. So we need a different instance. Now, it doesn't need to be different versions. Everything should be the same, but it needs to be a different instance. So this is very important. Now, I want to do a comparison, uh, but every time I do this, people tell me they don't recognize the symbols I use, specifically one of them. So I'm just going to cover with you so you know my um, index or the legend. This is a check, right? This is for OK. We agree. Happy. What about this? This is no, right? Does anyone know this? Because we use this. At, when I used to go to school, I was allowed. And we use this symbol that basically says, yes, but not entirely. Like, sort of. Like, you did something right, but it wasn't complete. Is that OK? Can everyone understand what I mean by this now? Excellent. So let's talk about these. I share here CPAN, CPAN minus, CPAN plus, CPM. But it also refers to all of the installers that are language specific. Okay, that would include Popeye, that would include uh, Gems, that would include NPM, that would include all of them. And it's generally, but pretty much. First, they don't provide pre-built. Almost all of them will download source and build it. For a lot of them, they don't really need C compilers, but they will probably need some kind of build system. NPM has one, Ruby has one, Python has one, Perl has one, we all have one. All right? And they don't really provide pre-builds. 
You might have an exception, but they would be an exception. When it comes to dependencies, they are very good. CPAN will know the system of, of CPAN itself, so CPAN minus will also know it, and CPM and CPAN plus. So they will be able to depend on other Pro libraries really well. They will know it because it's their world. PyPy the same, it will be the same uh, with gems. But they don't get dependencies that are outside of their realm. So Perl, depending on a Ruby thing, that depends on a C thing, that depends on a C++ thing, that depends on an Erlang thing, yeah, that's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. Perl took it a step forward trying to resolve this with the alien namespace. Does, is anyone familiar with the alien namespace? It attempts to solve this, but eh, and it definitely is not pre-built either. All right, accuracy. Accuracy, they know well. They are accurate. They don't have all of the dependencies, but they're definitely accurate about the ones that they have. So it's good. But they're not atomic. If you install one dependency that uses 100 more, the 50th failed, you now have 49 new modules installed. Whoops. Your rollback is halfway through on that installation. All right. What about revert? Barely. Now you can uninstall. That's new. But we still don't have revert, so you can't go one step before. And we do have multiple instances in almost all of them. You have virtual env, local lib, all of these things. Pretty much every language invented that. You have Perl brew, PL env, they all do that. There is an anomaly mention for Carton. Carton allows some of those ideas, like pre build, you can get that and then you could reuse that. But that's basically the added advantage. RPM and Deb and the likes, they're system packaging systems, which sounds kind of weird, but they're meant to maintain one cohesive system. They're meant to maintain your laptop, your computer, your server. So they are pre-built, which is speed. Can you imagine trying to install on a server and now having to install 100 modules? That's not gonna happen. So you have pre-built RPMs, you have pre-built Debs, it's great. The dependencies are really good. The dependencies are really good because every RPM depends on an RPM. So they can handle it really well. But the accuracy is pretty bad because they don't have the subtleties and the understanding of each one of those meta systems. RPM does not understand Perl that well. For example, RPM doesn't understand the versioning in Perl. And the versioning in Perl is different in the versioning in Node, different in the versioning in Gem in Ruby, so these are different. RPM basically has to represent it once for everyone. So it gets it wrong. We could not upgrade a work for a while, the path tools distribution, because one version was 1.700, the other version was 1.8. Now we know in Pro versioning that 1.8 is 1.800, so it's cool. But RPM said, no, 700 is greater than eight in my book, so it wouldn't upgrade. So you have ways around that, but it's, it's not very good in accuracy, it's pretty bad. It is atomic, or at least it has the capability of being atomic, which is pretty nice. It can revert, but you could probably write a plugin for it. And it definitely does not support multiple instances, but this is on purpose. It is on purpose because it has to maintain one cohesive system. So you can have multiple RPM installations. What usually people do is put the variation they want in the name, in the identifier. So if I wanted two versions of Pro at the same time, I would call one Pro 524 and I would call the other one Pro 526. And then we have two Pearls and you have to build all of the modules against each one separately. We had to do this. You also have Homebrew and all of these solutions that are more user focused, which is like the new thing, except that it doesn't really work on servers. It is the, I would say this is the works on my laptop version of packaging systems. Because literally, it is meant to work on your laptop and that's it. Which is great, but that doesn't work on servers. So okay, what do they do? They have some pre -builds. Some of them don't have pre -builds. Some of them try to have pre builds if they can, but don't always. Dependencies are pretty good because homebrew, et cetera, they depend on themselves. So again, same idea. Their accuracy is pretty bad, same reason. Atomicity, no. Reversion, no. And multiple instances, no. Even if you count multiple users, each user will have one, but a user cannot have more than one, unless you really fiddle with it. Homebrew specifically allows you to fiddle with it. I think they can do that, but it's definitely not out of the box recommended or an ideal solution. Specifically, I like to for Bazel. People have asked me about Bazel while I was working on Paquette, and while Bazel is a nice build architecture, 
It is meant specifically for things that Google does the way Google does them, which is surprise, not the way anyone else does. But you can build whatever they do. For Paquette's perspective, Paquette could use Bazel and does not replace it in any way. So you could actually use it if, it, if you wanted to, if anyone's interested in that. And active state deserve an, a very good mention. They have PPMs, they have packaging that they do for pre-built stuff. So you, if you're using Perl and you have active state Perl on, then you can actually install pre-built stuff and it's really nice. All right, so this is the table of comparisons. And you can pretty much see that none of them really solve everything. We have a bunch of these X's and sort of's, and those sort of's are not fun to fix. Okay, they're not fun. And sometimes they're not that even possible. So at some point I realized we kind of need a different thing. So I suggested Paquette. I didn't call it that, but I suggested it. And what I basically said was, well, the parts that are good we should keep, the parts that are bad we should replace with where it is good. Which sounds really easy, because if I would have done it, I would just copy paste the symbols and ta-da, new table. But um, the implementation of it is pretty difficult. And we do this using two specific uh, concepts. The first one is delegation. Paquette specifically tries to be, I wouldn't say stupid, I would say ignorant. It tries to not know, okay? It specifically says, every time I don't know something, I'm not gonna try know, I'm gonna ask someone who does know, which is really cool. I think I should do it more in general myself. And generalization. So every time you can have one solution that would fit all in a generalized way, it will do that. So it does both of them, and they seem contradictory, and they are sometimes, but sometimes they work really well together. So let me introduce you to a few things here. First, the stages in which you use Paquette. The first stage is that you generate. Paquette will use metadata systems in order to generate configurations for you, similar to how you would generate a spec with RPM or stuff like that. It just does it better in my opinion, which is completely unbiased. Then you build all, everything. So you take the sources, the original code, you take all these new spec files, and you ask Paquette to build, and it will create artifacts, which we call parcels, because Paquette is a package in Dutch, and parcels are par parcels in English that the post office would deliver as packages. Just go with me, it's parcels. Then you have an installation phase, the installation would just Install them in, you know this, and then you run it. Because it is a completely contained, self-contained environment, you need to ask Paquette to run this. And it could be done without Paquette and with Paquette, which is kind of cool. So generating, let's talk about this. What we do is actually scaffolding, completely based on metadata. Each system has its own metadata. So the scaffolding, the first level is general, it's generic, then the second level is very specific, it's delegated. So each language or each what we call category would have a different metadata system. Perl is just one. Ruby would be another. Node would be another. Python would be another. And any metadata based system we could use and we could query and we could generate stuff with. For Perl we actually go to MetaCPAN and we go to the API and ask what kind of dependencies do you have. We get the real dependencies. RPM specifically does a grep on Stuff we don't, we query APIs. It's open, it's out there, and one of the people working on this project, Miki Nasriachi, is also a core developer of MetaCPAN. So we're able to say, hey, this doesn't work, or this is a bug, or this doesn't work the way we should, and that would be nice to have. So we get to add things to the API. Yay, open source. Okay. This is an example of adding something. So we call Paquette Manage, which is the control of all the repositories, which I'll talk about soon. We ask it to add a new package. There are two categories that you see here. One is native, which basically means compiles to native, that we see, C++, stuff like that. And the other one is Perl. And in one of them, you can see the name of the package. The native would be Perl, which is the interpreter itself and the version you want. The other one would be the category Perl, and the answer to would be the module that we want or the distribution that we want, and it will just go and find the latest version in MetaCPAN. This is how a spec file might look like, although it doesn't have to look like that. Paquette okay, doesn't actually care about formats, which is interesting, and I'll talk about that soon. But if you had it in JSON, this is how it might look like. You have a definition of a package that includes the category, very important because it helps us understand what metadata systems to go to, what build system to use, then the name of it, the version of it, and the version could be anything you want, another interesting perspective in Paquette, but if you use this correctly, 
here, you can actually make it reflect the upstream. And then you could use the release version in order to know what is your variation of that upstream version. Let's talk about prereqs, all of our dependencies. This is how it might look like for, oh, let me see. For Perl, you have a configure that is xutils make maker and it has a version. And this now talks about other paquet packages and parcels. This is not a dependency on CPAN. This is a dependency on another paquet thing. The dependencies have phases. There's configure, there's test, there's runtime, and paquet knows which ones to go to. This is an example of a build command. You just ask it to build. You say, I want you to build from the Perl category, the YAML package, a version 1.70. That's it. And the nice thing is because it knows the category, this is where it delegates and says, you know what, I don't know how to build Perl. If you look at RPM, it's basically a set of hard-coded commands that are copy-pasted on every spec file so it knows how to build the thing. But it doesn't do that. It doesn't try to know. It basically says, you know what, I don't know how to do this. But there's a tool chain for Perl. I'm just going to ask the tool chain to build it. And that's what it does. It doesn't have a lot of logic on how to build. It doesn't have a build system at all. It delegates to other build systems knowing what kind of package you have. For native, for example, it will use the makefile. Doesn't invent its own makefile. Just uses what exists because it knows this is a native package. It might have makefile. I'll use that one. And installation is fairly trivial. You just ask to install. And run. I like run because what we want to do is two different things. See, we always look for flexibility. It's hard sometimes because you've got to focus and you've got to pick one thing hoping that you don't paint yourself in a corner. But at the same time, we really wanted to not do that. So in run, we have two options. The first option is to basically say, paquet run, and you tell where you want to run it from. Paquet, when it installs, it can install anywhere. There's a default, but it can install to multiple directories. So when you use the run, you give it a directory from which you want to run things. What it will do is spew into the terminal all of these environment variables. I think roughly five at the moment. If you take them and put them in your profile, in your bash RC, in your init scripts and stuff like that, the current user or process will be able to use whatever is installed there. That could be C dependencies, that could be C libraries, that could be programs, that could be Perl modules, that could be Perl itself, and that could be all of those together built against each other, completely self-contained, and you just need those few lines. Similar to Perl brew and local lib. And similar to those, you can also ask it to run something specific and say, well, I want to run specifically this command. And this is very useful because you can put this in a shebang. So you can have a script that it has a shebang that basically will make sure that script is run with that stuff. So it's kind of nice. There's one design decision we made early on. A lot of it was influenced um, by a colleague of mine, Gonzalo Diethon, who gave talks at Yapsi. Uh, previously, he wrote HTTP access headers and HTTP access cookies and a few other stuff because eh, you give him a challenge, he enjoys it. So we came up with things called repositories. So we have three different things we want to store. First, we want to store the sources. These are the actual files that you want to build. Then we want to store the specs, which is the configuration on how to build them and what to do with them. And then we have the generated output, the artifacts, which are the parcels. So where do we store them? So we saw a spec, and it was a JSON file. Great. What if you don't like JSON? What if you prefer YAML? Forget that. What if you don't want to store it on a server like everyone does with RPM and Deb and all of those? You want to store them on a database. Oh, well, then you need to serialize stuff. Well. What if you want them on a network? Oh, but then you have to set up a mirror, and on the other side, there has to be a file server that is connected to an NFS that maybe is connected. You know what? Forget that. Instead, we introduce something called repositories that have repository backends. A repository has a way to store either content, like a spec, which is just content, or it could store a file, which could be a parcel, or it could be a source. It could be whatever you want. And each backend defines how that's done. So the repository is a generic interface, and the delegation goes into backends. Let me give you examples so it sinks in a bit. We have a backend called a file backend. So if you want to store all of your specs in files, you can use the 
file backend for the repository for the spec. And this is, by the way, just configuration. It's actually fairly simple to configure. And the file backend will just define a way to save that as a file. By default, it's JSON, but you can control that. You can ask, well, I want it to be a different file. You can control the extensions. It maintains its own index for it. Or you could say, you know what? Actually, my specs, I want to store them in a database. Even my parcels, I want to store them in a database. I'm going to have like a really nice web interface with REST and blah, 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 blah. So you can store them in a database, and it will sort out how to do that. The interface right now is DBI, but we could introduce one for Elasticsearch or other systems. And you know, having mirrors is always great. And we decided to implement mirrors simply as an HTTP repository backend. So you could say, my packages, for example, my parcels, things that I'm actually building and finished building, I want to store them in a repository that has an HTTP backend. And what that will do is actually just upload them somewhere else. Ta-da, we implement Mirror. That simple. Ah, that's pretty cool. And they're also completely interchangeable. And that was Gonzalo's idea. They're completely interchangeable. You can store anything anywhere. You can store specs with just like a blob of configuration in a database or remotely or in a file. You can store a spec, which is, I'm sorry, a source, which is a directory in any one of these. You can store a parcel, which is a built artifact, like a .rpm file or a .deb file. And you can store them anywhere in all of these, interchangeably, completely. And Paquet doesn't know the difference and does not care. It just delegates onwards and says, well, just store it. I don't care how you do it. You can implement a set of mirrors on top of mirrors on top of mirrors in a tree-like structure for all of your parcels to be installed on your servers by simply chaining them together. Because for an HTTP, we also implemented the opposite, which is a server. If you call paquet serve, it starts a PSGI web server, web service. Actually, if you don't have a web server, it will start the default development web server that comes with Plaque, but if you run it from a web server like Starman or MicroWSGI, et cetera, it will start a PSGI app for that web server, and it has a web service behind it. And the web service behind it will get its own configuration, receive stuff, and then decide what to do with them onwards, which means I'll store it in a file, or I'll store it in a database, or I'll pass them on to another web server. Can chain them infinitely. None of this is something extra configuration, extra change to the program. It's all components and pieces. That's it. It's that simple. So I'm going, I'm going really fast. I have more time, which is great. So I want to talk a little bit about the status. We've been developing it for a while. Our problem was mainly not getting it working, because we got it working fairly early. Our problem had been introducing it at the company. Right now, we have, I think, over 1,400 modules in production, used every day. And I can't vouch that all of them are used, but we definitely package all of them. We currently use RPMs, and we need to support several Pro versions. So we support 5.18.2. We're starting to support 5.24. But we also have the other systems that are using this, that are updating systems and cannot replace themselves. So they also exist. So we now have four copies of all of these 1,400 modules and of the Perl versions themselves. And we have something similar going on with Python because it will happen. You have Python 2.7, you have Python 3, and if you patch any of it and you want to have two different versions, you want to check if you're using jmalloc. Has anyone using here jmalloc? I'm, I'm assuming Nick for some reason, I don't know. Um, you might edit the source in order to compile it differently and then test for benchmarks. So you might have even more versions. And the build system that we have is fairly good, except because it's built on RPMs, it suffers from a lot of these problems, like not being able to update path utils. We weren't able to use uh, Procritic for a while because Procritic is listed in not a lot of tests, and the grep would find it. So there was a grep-v that would invert and reverse that, and then we couldn't use Procritic anywhere because it would catch it. Uh, we had a list of... Um, things that grep would avoid using because it would find them and you would think that those are packages. Packages, like, packages that people put in tests. It would think, oh, this is a real package. Let me try and find it. Oh, it doesn't exist. This failed. Where 
test base class foo is not a real package. Someone just wrote it in a test. So it took us a while. But we did build it. It is finished to a degree. We have started using it. Last week, we, last week, two weeks ago, we introduced one server role that we have that is completely using Paquette with 1,400 modules and 524.0. Once we convert enough things to it, we're just going to bump it up to 526 because now it's not a problem. Paquette can have one command to rebuild everything based on the interpreter. So it's pretty neat. So let's cover it. Basically, it works. Basically. There's a ton of stuff that we want to do are not there yet. We currently support the native category, the Perl category, and the Node.js category. I'm really not sure why the Node.js, but we were trying it out. We're not using it. Uh, we're in my team, I think there's a few things maybe uh, somewhere. But someone asked us if it could be done. So we're like, ah, oh, well, let's, let's try it. We have uh, plans for doing more. We just don't use a lot of uh, languages. We have some Go, we have some Ruby, we have some Python, but mostly everyone's covered. So we want to do Go, and then we'll probably split it up because Go is, <sighs> languages are fun. Go doesn't actually do uh, libraries, except it does. Um, so Go actually has both. Um, they're lying to you, uh, not on purpose. It's a good idea, but they actually do have both libraries and programs, and you need to split those up, and it has a real, really weird way of doing it, but in Paquette it would be definitely possible and easy. We want to introduce meta categories, so categories that will do whatever you want them to do. One example that we want is a bag category. And a bag category could be an archive of a bunch of other stuff. So you could say, let's say I have a server role, and it's called foo, and it uses a bunch of these things. Well, I want to have a category called bag, and then that will have a package for my server role, and that will build all of those things into one package. The installation will be way faster. And you can actually deploy this like a container. It's pretty cool. We support make files. We have command line tools for pretty much everything, which is pretty cool. The manage command has about six or seven subcommands. Uh, what else? And it's it, its own subcommand. Sub it's all free. It's all open source. It's just really nice. I'm really happy. But we have a few sharp edges. So the documentation, last time I gave this talk, it was one month ago, and it was basically either non-existent or outdated. But it has been going through a major overhaul, and a lot of it is currently documented, and we're working on it uh, a lot to complete soon. There were tests, but it was really hard to test this. And we wrote some, and then we changed a bunch of stuff, and then all the tests were invalidated. So we will probably tackle tests after documentation. Feature-wise, we're kind of where we want to be at the moment. We want to support more builders with time. We currently aren't using. We didn't find any other stuff. But there's CMake and Scones and other stuff. We want to be able to support them. They're fairly simple. It's basically to know that there is a tool chain for something. That includes additional languages. If we use Ruby, if we use Go, we might add them. And we want to add tags. And the idea with tags is that you could associate a package with something else that you could search by, you could install by, you could create dependencies by. And these things are really hard to find in other packaging systems. It is very hard to say, rebuild everything for Perl 524, or build, rebuild everything that uses Ruby, or rebuild everything, or even give it a category, show me all of the fast packages, which might be a configuration of the package that, that use different libraries or optimizations. And it is very hard to do in packaging systems. But if we can add tags to ours, we could basically tag packages and releases and do interesting things with them. So we can have our fast version of Perl, our debugging version of Perl, et cetera. In most packaging systems, you kind of put it in the name. You stick it in there. It's terrible. All right. And lastly, we actually want to normalize our tooling. Documentation is hard. Tests are hard. The hardest thing is just one interface that is consistent. Okay, it is incredibly difficult, and I feel like our tooling could really use a step up in this to make uh, one clear form to how the tools work, how they look like, uh, the kind of output they give you, the kind of input that they get. If anyone's interested in actually helping us define what would be a nice, clear, consistent tooling interface, we would really appreciate it. Because coding, let me tell you this, coding is not that hard. Understanding how to do something is much harder. Like, we could write Perl code for a command line. We're terrible at thinking of a, a comfortable interface. So we'd love some help with that. 
Currently, it is sitting at this address on my GitHub. It is only waiting a little bit, but it will be moved to the Booking.com GitHub account, which is actually at github.com slash booking.com. But uh, currently, it's here. It will be moved soon enough. And this was something that I was only able to do because I work in a company that was like, hey, that actually sounds like a good idea. It seems like you have a plan. Go for it. Here's a team. And uh, it, it scared me very much, but it worked. And uh, I'm really happy I got the chance to work on it. And the company was like, yeah, let's open source it. And why is it not on our GitHub yet? Um, so I, I will fix that. And uh, if you are looking to work on things like that, or maybe other open source stuff, not everything that we have is open source, but we do work on open source stuff as well. And that includes the Perl language, if you're interested. We have some of the core developers. Just come see me later. And that is all I have for you today. Thank you very much. Now, the lovely Dr. Nicholas is wearing his known microphone. No, um, well, OK, also GFDI shirt. Um, and if anyone has any questions, this is a great time. We have quite a bit of time. Um, uh, the first one is the person next to him. Yes, my dear Max. Um, do you, how do you deal with distro prefs, that is, patches, local patches to modules to make them work or? So I read this thing about don't tips for when you give a, a talk, and it was don't say good question. And I, I, I don't like that, because some questions hit a point that you wanted to raise, but didn't know where and how and when. That is one of them. So good question. Um, so OK, one of the things that people do with packaging systems is they have patches. For RPM, you actually have a place to put in patches, and you will start to apply those patches. I personally have a great aversion to this, and Paquette does not support this. However, we did think about adding it. We do want to add phases so you can control this. The problem that I have with this is that it opens the door to a behavior that we usually should not partake in. And what I mean is that in many cases, the easiest way to maintain a package is not to patch it in that sort of way with patch files. A good way, what we want to do and what we started doing is we will have either our local Git, uh, GitHub, uh, sorry, our, yeah, our own GitHub, which is public on github.com slash booking.com, or our own local Git setup, and we will keep a fork. If it's something that could be public, we will keep it public. If it's something that it's uh, some kind of fork that we really need locally because we, we can't share that, I think there's maybe one, we will keep it in that Git repo. We will maintain two branches. One will be the upstream. The other one will be our upstream. And then all of our patches will go as commits on our upstream. When the upstream originally will change something, we will just rebase. So we will always have their upstream. We will always have our branch. And our branch will always be on top of theirs. And then we could easily rebase patches on new versions. When it comes with patches locally as patch files, it doesn't have to be. But it tends to be a situation where uh, you just drop in a new tarball and you hope that the patch will work on it. You don't have a rebasing phase where you can find where in their history your patch broke. You have their version 1, and then you have their version 2. If it broke along the way, it doesn't, it doesn't apply. You're, you're screwed. So we want to handle this with commits to be able to rebase, to be able to find and bisect where it failed. We had one interesting patch I found. We have a, bu a bunch of patches that we had to eliminate when we started working on Paquette to normalize all of this. And most of them we didn't need. And there was one that I really liked because it had use 5.10. And the sysadmin who worked on it is not that familiar. He asked me, what does this do? And I said, well, it makes sure that this uses 5.10. And he said, OK, but we, we aren't using 5.10 anywhere. Our most minimal version is 5.18.2. What do you mean use 5.10? I said, well, it, it, someone was probably building this on. on but he said, OK, but if, if and he took like 10 minutes to realize this does nothing. But it was there. Really not sure why. So with. With Git and history, I think it allows to maintain that better, which is kind of why I prefer not to put that in. We might eventually will. Really depends on what uh, users will ask for. Does anyone have any other questions? Easy. Hey, you just all came and sat here? Anyone? Well, yeah, I knew I was okay. quite likely to ask a question. Yes. Um, um, so one, one thing I would very often do is I'd have the system Perl installed and use them in Perl, and then I'd have a few dozen builds of Perl installed on a slash opt in there using a particular naming convention that, convention that says how they've been built and all that sort of thing. Um, so 
with Paquette, would you do that with a a single spec file and then drive the commands to say what you want to build and where to build it? Or? Yes. So, yes and no. You would have multiple specs because you could have as many specs as you want. You can have as many build artifacts as you want and you can have as many sources as you want as long as the name category, version and release are not the same. So these are the four uh, first level elements, definitions. If they're not the same, you can have as many of these as you want. So, so if I wanted to have both uh, a, a non-debugging and debugging build, I'd have to have different names right. for them. So there are two ways you could do this. The first one, we want to introduce tags. That would be the way forward, where the tags would become a first level attribute also, so you could differentiate them. That's why we want that. And the second one, which you could already do, is the Paquette HTTP server, the Paquette server, what it does is actually allow you to have as many repositories as you want based on path. So you can have slash pro 524, slash pro 524 dash debug. Those would be two different repositories. And one would be the same, they could have the same package, but with different configurations. And you could even store just the specs there and the sources in a general sources repo. You could really go nuts with this. It's very, very flexible. It's very malleable, the server itself. I would be happy to, to add more afterwards. OK. OK. Well, I yes. think you're going to need to give the cookbook for this. <laughs> yes. It will take me long. We need to write a tutorial about this. And there's a lot of explanation on all of the decision making and, and the reasons things are the way they are. Because we've made a lot of changes and decisions that are geared towards putting you in the right path on how to do this, so we stay flexible. But in some cases, there are way too many options, which is very similar to a philosophy of Perl, but hopefully your documentation will guide you to the ones that serve you best, which should also be a philosophy of Perl. Does anyone have any other questions? We have room for, maybe some time for one or two more. All right, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for staying here, listening to me, staying alive, staying awake and have a good rest of the conference. Thank you, Sawyer. <laughs>